Natural Resources Minister Gwede Mantashe is hosting a signing ceremony with the first three preferred bidders of the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Procurement Program. The program was launched on the 12th of April back in 2021 and the successful bidders were announced shortly after that. The minister is in fact now addressing. Let's listen in. They want the private sector. Uh, and then we didn't agree because I believe in the state, a strong state is good for the private sector. Uh, because if it is weak, it can facilitate growth and performance of the private sector. So the state is not a competitor, it's a facilitator in any sector it is operating in. That's what I believe in. Uh, that's why with all these labels that I, I gave you, uh, one of the things that I've never done is to stop growth of renewables. Uh, what I want to see happening is a situation where the debate on energy become less polarized. We debate energy, we debate principles, we work together to ensure that there is security of supply, not polarized uh, discussion between technologies. Um, in South Africa, I know EDF is, is very heavy on nuclear. Here we're told not to even look at nuclear, it's too expensive. Uh, and I don't agree with that. Nuclear is going to work, if renewables are going to work uh, perfectly, they will have to be uh, complemented by nuclear because base load from nuclear will make renewables sustainable. That's my theoretical framework. I'm not an engineer, I'm a social scientist, and the, the only lies I have is to say what I think and what I believe in. If engineers have preached properly to me, I take it and I make it mine. So the IRP uh, is actually a framework that propagates the development of mixed technologies. We think that you need a lot of renewables, you need to scale down on coal, not move out, scale down uh, systematically uh, because if you are uh, reckless in moving out of coal, you're going to cause more disasters. Uh, in the coal belt in Pumalanga, the continuous coal mining covers 10 towns. Continuous, no break, and the home of a number of coal power stations. That will be decommissioned over time. We have uh, contributed 40% uh, and 40% from the Serbian government in buying the Romco pipeline because we think that in ESCOM should be able to allow us to repurpose some of the power stations from coal to gas. That's a movement. Europe has accepted gas and nuclear as part of green transition and therefore we can't be left behind and uh, believe that you can close everything else and just go for renewables. Energy availability factor uh, of renewables, coal and nuclear, quite, it's not the same. It's not the same. For renewables, it's about 30% at best. And because it's time, it has time limit until there is a sustainable battery support system. Uh, coal is about 70% plus, uh, nuclear is 80% plus. So that's the combination we need for our country to, 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 to prosper. I'm quite happy to uh, be here today and accept this process. Okay. I don't accept it because uh, I'm told to say so. I support it. I love your input on the, the, the importance of uh, localization, empowerment of blacks. But let me tell you, uh, challenges you are going to face, okay? Somebody uh, sent me a message. Uh, he said, yeah, you are going to launch a project on Thursday on renewables. And, and that's, that's rubbish. Uh, it's just a scheme to empower Abos Bali. Nini Abos Bali. I was bad. And I, I wrote back and said, no, the mistake you're committing is that majority of renewable projects are still owned by foreign companies. 
blacks are getting into the space, those who have courage enough to get into the space are getting into the space. Now you are labeling them as a boss man. And you are going to come back in two years' time and accuse us of white monopoly capital. Now, I, I'm talking to the dynamics of South Africa. I love when you, you are brave, you get into a space, you travel in a space that people are reluctant to travel in. That is courage. Courage is not that you have never had fear. Courage is your ability to conquer and overcome fear. That is what is called courage. And if you don't have the courage to overcome fear, you will not take an initiative. You will be a follower all your life. So I'm very happy with this project, and maybe that EDF is here. It's a company I loved all my life. I've been loving it. If I follow it. When it is privatized, I follow it. When it is renationalized, I follow it. Because, <laughs> because it's one of the companies that I monitor, I look at uh, in global companies. It's quite an important player. It is here. Thank you very much. Continue doing more here. Continue doing more. When we, uh, we get into the other uh, sectors of the energy, please be willing to come. You have experience in nuclear, you have experience in gas, you have experience because there you have got ED gas, eh? ED gas. Eh? Now, ED gas, you see? electricity difference, gas difference, eh? GDF. GDF. We want all that experience to help us grow here. Grow local capacity, grow local talent, make our people participate. You know, there's nothing as painful as coming from a background where you are not a citizen to become a citizen and then begin to want to work in the economic space, which we are not allowed to participate in. Uh, I was sharing this experience with a number of them. I said, I came to mining many years ago. Uh, when I came here, I was highly educated. I had metric. Yeah, I had metric. Highly educated. But I couldn't put my hand on a plastic certificate, which is a basic qualification for mining, precisely because I was not a scheduled person. So the progress we're making, we should not throw it away when we're irritated, when there's load shedding, uh, a group executive, when there's load shedding, Society becomes very angry, and they tell us all sorts of things. They give us all descriptions. They, they tell us how reckless we are. And I always clarify that there is a company called ESCOM that actually uh, uh, manages uh, load shedding. And my own view is that if we can improve and make ESCOM operate optimally, we will not have load shedding. That's my conviction. Because ESCOM is having an idling 20,000 megawatts that is not decommissioned, that is not giving us energy. Let's work on those 20,000 megawatts to give us energy as we bring new capacity, renewables, gas, and nuclear. As we give that new capacity, the existing capacity must be operated optimally. And if we do that, we'll not go wrong. Therefore, if uh, we are appreciating the fact that sometimes we call this uh, an electricity crisis, uh, I've been uh, won over by an argument that we don't have electricity crisis, we have a base load crisis. Uh, because if we allow our base load to be corroded, we are not going to resolve the problem of load shedding. And, and many people, when they talk about um, uh, renewables, they will tell you, yeah, Mantasha, the crisis is Mantasha's fault. Fine. It's an occupational hazard to be insulted. It's an occupational hazard. It cannot be my fault because even if we allow uh, renewables, we give them contract, we sign agreements with them. They're not going to put energy on the grid on Saturday. 
We sign an agreement. There is going another process. There is another complicated process of actually building the facility that will generate energy. That is the lead time to actually putting energy on the grid. That's why any company that won a bid in the 2018 bid for agreement is only putting energy on the grid now. So, bid five, thank you for congratulations. And we must not put pressure on you to put electricity on the grid in two months. It's not going to happen. We must accept that you are going to build that facility. You are going to give us additional energy in the medium to long term. We need to. Actually, we have committed in IRP 2019 to increase renewables by 18 percent and reduce coal by 15 percent. That's a commitment we've made. So. We're sticking to that commitment. We're busy reviewing IRP. Uh, maybe we'll come with different conclusions. I'm very happy to be here today. I congratulate you. I want to encourage many of you to generate more electricity into the future. Transmission, transmission lines to the Northern Cape. Okay. You know, people say Northern Cape in no port now and another renewable in Eastern Cape in Middleburg. That's one area. It's one area. No but in Middleburg is one area. It's Middleburg, few kilometers, no port. Okay. When you go deep into the Northern Cape, you are going to find it difficult to get that energy into the grid. No port may be redirected to the Eastern Cape grid if it is as capacity, and that's it. Let's build the transmission lines where it is. Actually, Northern Cape, nobody planned it because it was not the heart of coal mining. It is now the heart of sun and wind, and therefore we must build those transmission lines so that we can access that energy. And I'm sure if you meet uh, Dr. Saul, who is the Premier of the Northern Cape, he will give you the same message. I'm going there tomorrow to the Northern Cape. On Saturday, TM, I'll be working in Wonder Club Bay. <laughs> Wonder Club Bay in the Northern Cape, on the ocean, south of Port Norloth, uh, because we must develop that part of the world. We can't be open to a situation where uh, there is disruption in Gauteng and KZ10, 50% of the GDP disappears. It can't be. We must spread development to provinces that we need to ignore. We need that development to be spread all over. So we must develop the Northern Cape, we must develop the Eastern Cape, which is poorly developed. And I think we must have a convention with environmentalists to appreciate that we must coexist, we must stay together, we must work together, we must develop the country. We can't uh, push a situation that is anti-development. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here. I'm happy to be here. Let's sign the agreement, and then begin to generate energy. Give us more energy. Give us more energy. Give us more energy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Honorable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now go straight into Q&A. Um, I know there are many questions, but I'm going to ask that um, we try and focus the questions on what we hear for um, today. I'm sure, Minister, you touched on load shedding, and I'm sure there's one or two questions. <laughs> no, we'll entertain them. But <laughs> Yeah, I'm not limiting them. I'm just uh, helping refocus. Um, so I think I will take them maybe three hands at a time, and then we then allow the panel um, um, to, to, to respond. Um, I see there's a hand here. Okay, there's three hands already here in front. We'll take them in that order. No. They, they, 
Yes. Um, um, hi there. This is... Please introduce uh, yourself. Sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm Julia Evans from Daily Maverick. Um, so this is regarding the delays. Um, so considering this process takes so long... Um, and the 2019 RIP says that we're meant to have already um, 1,600 megawatts of wind um, active this year. Why was the request for proposals um, only announced in 2021? Why was it not immediately announced uh, when the 2019 RIP came out? Um, can I ask more than one question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, and then... Um, Regarding the base load, um, Minister Mantashe, what do you say to energy experts who say that our base load generators are actually able to meet our current base load requirements almost exactly, and that it's actually the stuff above the base load that poses the media problem? Um, and then a question to uh, the energy companies. Uh, what's the estimated P50 and P90 annual energy yields? Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Therese? Thanks. Uh, Terence Creamer, Engineering News. Uh, just in terms of, uh, Bernard mentioned October being the, the final date for signing the other 22 projects. What happens beyond October if those projects are not signed? And can you give us a similar deadline for the risk mitigation outstanding projects? Secondly, to EDF, the exchange rate has moved quite considerably since you signed. Can you give us some indication? I know you haven't reached financial close, but uh, the sort of ballpark, what sort of cents per kilowatt hours are you going to be coming in at with these three projects? And could you also give us some technical details around these projects, where the turbines are from, how much local content are in, is in that, and who are the main contractors? And then to Eskom, bid window six, to avoid the budget quote the delays that we saw for bid window five, uh, what, has, what is being done to prepare for bid window six? I know you mentioned the grid uh, capacity assessment is available. Will there be limitations, for instance, on where projects can be located under bid window six to stop, uh, to prevent the bid, bid budget quote delays that we saw this time around? And then to the minister, in terms of streamlining procurement, we, we can see how long it's taken to get to this point. We've only got three projects. I uh, know we're now talking about a battery program, et cetera. How are we going to get these projects uh, procurement processes streamlined so that we can move with much quite greater speed in getting to financial close. Thank you. Hi, it's Danine Rasmus from Business Day. I think Terence has asked all the questions on everybody's list. <laughs> but uh, maybe then to just to just add to those and to EDP, just to, um, there was a quote on on the job hours that's being created. But can you maybe just explain in terms of job numbers? So how many jobs for how many years? Just so that it's easier to understand. All right. No, thanks for the for the questions. We will. Um, try and respond to all the questions that have asked, been asked. Uh, Minister, let me start with you. Um, okay. Or oh, you want to come last? Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, let me... Okay. I guess... Okay. Let me respond to the first one. It's fine. I'll respond to the first one on the RFPs and why does it take uh, so long. I think, I think it's a good question for me because a lot of people have limited understanding of the process. If you look at the process that we have in place, once the IRP is, um, is promulgated or a determination, first there are a number of steps that have to happen. Once the IRP is promulgated, the first step that you have to, to take is that you have to issue a determination. The determination goes to NASA for concurrence. Right? And part of the NESA process is that they are required to put it out for public consultation. So that period takes quite some time. And this particular um, uh, uh, Section 34 determination was the first one that we had issued under the IRP 2019. Um, I think it took NESA about six months, if not eight months, to actually... Uh, finally concurred to that uh, after the promulgation of the RP. 
they've since shortened the timelines. I mean, we've seen recently with the determination significantly shortened the timelines. The second part of the process is that when we develop the uh, IPP office develops the, the request for proposals, because ESCOM is the buyer, there is then interaction with ESCOM in terms of what we're putting out there to make sure that they are comfortable. But ESCOM also runs its own process uh, to make sure that uh, they do their own uh, due diligence as the buyer in terms of the, the process. And yes, we have identified that that is one part of the process that we seriously need to look at in terms of improving, right? Uh, in terms of how do we streamline that part of the process because it does take uh, quite some time. But why specifically the bid window five took time was because after bid window four, the risk profile has completely changed. I mean, there was a long discussion around um, how the risk allocation in bid window five compared to bid window four uh, should be should be should be should be managed. So that process took uh, quite a bit of time, and hence there was almost like it looked like there was a lull between the RF the IRP promulgation and when the RFP was 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 issued. Um, I'm going to ask the team from EDF to respond to the P50 question, the number of questions, to respond to the question around the job numbers, uh, job years, to respond to the question around the exchange rate and the cents per kilowatt hour. Um, yeah, I think, I think those, those are the three questions that were specific to yourselves. Maybe you want to use the... Um, thanks for your questions. Um, first of all, we are EDF, not EDP. Uh, EDP is Electricidad de Portugal, so it's another country. <laughs> We're from France. Um, that's, that was the first point. Um, the P50 of the three wind farms um, is between 1.7 and 1.8 terawatt hours per year, which is enormous. Um, yeah, it is a little bit less than a 50% load factor, which is I mean, it shows the, the fantastic resource uh, of the site uh, we have uh, developed. Um, in terms of local content, um, so we're above the 40% uh, value of the project that will be spent locally, which is quite a challenge. Uh, it's, it's something that we, we, we meet in the, in the countries where we operate, and it's always something that we, we try hard to achieve because we understand that we can only be sustainable in a country when we grow the local industry. So that's something that we've been working very hard at. Um, of course, in terms of the turbines, uh, there are no turbine manufacturers in South Africa. Uh, that's well known. Uh, but um, with our partner Goldwind, the, the, who will be the suppliers for the, these turbines, we've uh, worked on a concrete tower solution. Um, and the concrete tower manufacturer will be uh, built and developed um, in the immediate vicinity uh, of the project in the Middelburg uh, um, uh, town. So that's for the, for the local content. So in terms of, of job creations, you're also familiar with the fact that the program um, asks us very detailed commitments on job creations. So all these figures are detailed and, and I won't comment to, on each of them. They are, I think they, they uh, can be made available, but in terms of global number, uh, we are talking about uh, 2,230 uh, job creation opportunities uh, on the whole life cycle of the project. Obviously, the bulk of this uh, happens during the uh, two years of construction, um, but um, uh, long-term jobs will also be created uh, locally uh, for the operation phase to maintain the 78 uh, turbines and the main transmission, I mean, and the various substations that will enable the evacuation of the, uh, of the power. Um, Mr. Kremer, you asked the question about the, um, uh, I mean, the, about the, the final cost of construction. So, Bernd Magro uh, cited the fact that it's a project of, in the range of 11 billions uh, of investment. So, with 420 megawatts, uh, it's we are around 26 million rands per megawatt, which is a significant investment, and um, yeah. I think it's, uh, it's in the range of the, of the projects we can see these days. The construction of the substation uh, was 
uh, heavy on the on the on the project. It's a significant uh, chunk of the costs. Um, but due to the good wind, we could, uh, as I said earlier, uh, allow for this uh, construction. So that's it for the questions that were asked. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think there were a couple of questions around um, what we are doing to streamline and ensure that we don't cause delays on bid window six. Um, uh, two things. Uh, one is that a lot of work has been done between ESCOM uh, through the grid access unit and the IPP office to in fact streamline the processes uh, and to shorten the time, the turnaround time for, for uh, cost estimate letters and budget codes. Uh, secondly, uh, just as part of the illustration of uh, the change on bid window six, um, there are, as people may know, um, there's a requirement for a cost estimate letter. And for bid window six, all those that have been received by ESCOM have been issued. And if you look at the equivalent capacity of, of those applications, they total 32,000 megawatts. So ESCOM is trying to do its best to, to fast track uh, the dealing and addressing the quotations. Um, and last, uh, with regard to, you know, just being pragmatic, I think this point of transparency and working together, uh, we have indicated uh, where we have a, a available grid capacity, and there's a lot of interest that is being expressed around those facilities. Um, you will also have had the announcement that uh, ESCOM had also offered uh, to lease some of its land uh, vacant around some of the uh, power stations and, and, and uh, other facilities and uh, the subscription for those uh, total something like 1,800 megawatts, uh, which is you know just the first tranche of people who will build without a PPA with ESCOM. Um, they are building through the 100 megawatt or the new dispensation. So I think the industry is responding to to where the opportunities lie and to make take advantage of that. Clearly, what the minister said is very important, that we are working hard to develop the networks uh, to the southern parts of the country, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, and so on. Uh, but we have to go through the EIAs, we have to acquire the servitudes, and so on, and before we even get to building. So a lot of work is happening to also unlock those parts of the country. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we, um, I think it came from tenants. We, we've always maintained that the reason for the delay was uh, the BQ issuing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all the projects have now received their BQs. Um, and um, the next step is obviously to sign the agreements. It did take long to get these three projects agreements concluded. Uh, and what I'm happy about is the base agreements that we developed through this process should make the process um, much easier for the remaining 22 projects. So from where we are, we are ready for the remaining projects to come and then we sign by end of October. Um, I must mention that given you know, the load shedding that we're experiencing, we need this capacity like yesterday. So there's really no need for us to delay any further. And there will be other bid windows. So if you miss this bus, you know, they, there's another bid window that's coming. So that's, that's the approach that we're taking going forward. Similarly, with risk mitigation, um, we, we, we have until end of October to, to conclude that process. We were um, uh, looking at a few uh, optimization requests that we received from, from the preferred bidders in those program. Um, we had to make sure that we do things right. You know, legally. So there's been legal opinions and, and things that we needed to make sure that um, we don't compromise the process. And that has been finalized. And uh, again, where we are is we want to conclude both programs by end of October. Um, just to confirm what Mr. Skipper said, we have refined the BQ process. Um, and it's important to mention here that um, those who will be preferred bidders for bid window six, they will be given limited time to finalize their designs and hand them over to ESCOM for, for approvals. Uh, the one, I wouldn't say mistake, but the one lesson from bid window five is that uh, this process took longer, um, which is why we had to postpone the, 
April deadline for signing where some projects did not submit their designs on time for ESCOM to, to approve. So we, we found a way to manage that going forward. Um, DG, I'm not sure if there's another process. I think on streamlining the process going forward, the biggest risk, we have tried to look at what we can do on our side in uh, project documents, the RFP, the, the agreements. So those seems to be under control um, going forward. We, it shouldn't be a problem. The biggest risk that we see, and we have engaged the markets, um, the lenders, to see how, what is the optimal time, the most quickest way to get the, the lenders to approve, for example, their due diligence. Um, everything seems to be on, under control, but the biggest, weak, well, the weakest link seems to be the grid, which is why there is this focus between ourselves and the grid access unit too to deal with that with that issue. So we don't foresee um, the delays that we have seen in bid window five going forward. And I, I think we'll make the announcement in this regard for bid window six, you know, how soon we expect financial close um, going forward. So thank you very much. Uh, they have answered all the questions. <laughs> except that uh, on streamlining procurement, there is a great effort put into that. For example, as a result of the electricity crisis, uh, there is NECOM that has been put together from the presidency. And the beauty of that structure is that all the relevant ministers meet under one roof. Unlike the, the system that we've been using where if you want any approval, you need support of DPE, you need support of DJIC, Treasure, and all, all of us will meet under one roof. That will accelerate uh, procurement. You, uh, as an example, the bid window six, the increase of what should come out of bid window six from 2,600 to 4,200 is an agreement in, of the ministers together, that we need to increase that because we need to accelerate the supply of energy from renewables. All right, those are live visuals there from the signing ceremony for the first three preferred bidders of the Renewable Energy Independent Power Procurement Program. You would have heard Minister Mantashe was quick to say we shouldn't move out of coal, but rather scale down with the introduction of more renewable energy, which he also stressed that he does in fact support. He supports IPPs. He also mentioned that they would appreciate support from ESCOM to repurpose the old power stations from coal to gas. Well, that briefing continues, but that's where I leave it for